Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Emily Actrizandi, Managing Director of Atlantic Live, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our lunch conversation on humanity and tech. And I'd like to begin this conversation by asking everyone in this room a few questions. So I want a show of hands. Is there anyone in this room who does not have a smartphone? Okay then, raise your hand if you've checked your phone within the last 10 minutes. Okay. Keep your hands raised if you communicated on email, text, Twitter, Facebook, Telegram, Signal, within the last hour. Who read the news on their phone this morning? Okay. And is there anyone here who does not not sleep with their phone next to their bed? That's actually a fairly good number. Good for you. So those of you probably sleep better than the rest of us. And that's what we're here to explore today. How has technology changed our lives, our families, our culture, and our world, and where is it all headed? But before we begin, I'd like to thank Booz Allen Hamilton for their support of this program and the larger Atlantic Festival and for making today possible and this beautiful pavilion we're in. So please take a moment to look at some of their exhibits in the Innovation Zone. And before we begin our program, I'd like to welcome Gary Lebovich, Executive Vice President of Booz Allen Hamilton to the stage for some brief remarks. So Gary, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emily. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my role at Booz Allen is I am the next generation modernization leader for our technology infrastructure at the firm. I want to say beha on behalf of all of our consultants, technologists, and liberal arts and humanities majors, of which I am proudly one, I want to say welcome to the Booz Allen Hamilton Innovation Zone for today's Food for Thought Luncheon, Focus on Humanity and Technology, which we think is a very important topic within our firm and one that our employees really care deeply about. Today's conversation is very timely, as Emily noted. New technology introduces disruption. In fact, we're re realizing that technology is changing what it means to be human as we have come to know it. Technology is developing much faster than our culture and institutions can adapt and adopt to it. And this gap is introducing unintended consequences for how we manage our lives, both at home and in the workplace. We see this playing out in the news headlines every day from driverless cars, to drone deliveries, to immersive computing. We see the power for how we have shaped technology to make the world we live in more convenient and more accessible. Yet we're still coming to grips with the implications these technologies have on our lives. We, we are all now living through screens, if you will, creating a narrow bandwidth from which we view an increasingly artificial world that is safe and comfortable, but does not always reflect the re realities of our global environment that we live in. In some ways, you could argue we are beginning to lose our connection to reality altogether. At Booz Allen, we are implementing emerging technologies in both the public and commercial sectors with the goal of promoting change and generating results for our clients. Technology certainly enhances our lives and how we work, but it introduces new challenges as well, such as the privacy and security of the information we employ, as well as shifting the means of communication and interactions among family, friends, and colleagues topics that I'm sure we'll address today. Technology is changing our lives, but we must be the drivers of the future and think hard about, as a society, adjust to the constant pace of change, and how are we gonna build the policies and institutional frameworks that are necessary to manage the implications of what we have created for ourselves. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks for coming. Back to you, Emily. Thank you, Gary. And we've got an excellent panel in store. So a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Please silence your cell phones, but don't put them away. We'd like for you to join the conversation on Twitter. Use the hashtag TheAtlanticFest, all one word. And we'll be taking questions from the audience this afternoon. So please be thinking about what you'd like to ask. And now to our panelists, Derek Thompson, is an Atlantic staff writer and the host of our Crazy Genius podcast. 
Van Newkirk is also a staff writer at The Atlantic. Please welcome him. Laura Zimmerman is an education researcher at the Center for Learning and Development at SRI International. And leading the conversation, Atlantic staff writer and a member of our San Francisco Tech Bureau, Alexis Madrigal. So welcome, everyone. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Um, that was kind of an intense morning. I want everyone to know this is going to be a lot more relaxed, a lot more interactive. <laughs> Take a little deep breath, you know, settle in, come in from that middle range. You know, you can commit to this session, I promise. It's going to be fun. Um, now, what I want to talk about first is if smartphones are ruining our lives. What do you think? <laughs> Derek, you had a, a podcast episode, in fact, titled, Are Smartphones Ruining Our Lives? Uh, what'd you come so out? I should be able to answer this question. Yes, that's um, right. <laughs> so, you know... The way that I think about social media apps and my smartphone, the metaphor that I've sort of settled on is that my smartphone, especially plus Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, it's a little bit like a library with a food fight in the foyer. <laughs> so every single time I come up to the library, I think, oh, my, there's so many things I can discover in this library. There's interesting tweets from my boss and my colleagues. Um, there are historians and economists who are giving, delivering their, their papers and delivering you know, exegeses on the issues of the day. There's funny photos and memes. But rather than like, walk up the steps into the library and actually like, experience all this stuff, I get stuck in the food fight that's in the foyer. And I get jealous because some people's tweets are outperforming mine, and I get angry because some people's Instagram photos from vacation are more beautiful than mine, and someone insults me on one of the apps, and so I lose an hour sort of not insulting them back, but just burning with anger and writing and deleting <laughs> tweets. And so... That's sort of my relationship with the technology is so fraught because I, I so understand both the promise of all this access to technology and also understand my use of the technology, which is not altogether positive, is in fact often negative. So to the extent that they're ruining our lives, they're ruining our lives because we're staying in the foyer. You know, we don't have the self-restraint or the motivation to walk up those steps and appreciate that which this technology can actually do for us. Um, but the foyers are part of the library. So, you know, I blame these companies for having the foyer as well. Van, I know you took a couple months off Twitter at one point. Yeah. Um, and did that change anything for you to, you know, just go back to traditional news sources, do it the old way? Oh, you know, I, uh, when I got off Twitter, I slept eight hours a night. Um, <laughs> actually aged in reverse. Um, I felt better. My skin cleared up. I went to work and just was, you know, like floating on on a cloud. Um, no, actually, I didn't feel the kind of changes that I thought I would. Um, a lot of the sort of, there was still, there was a, a elimination of like the basic feedback mechanism. Like, like you said, it's, it's a competition when you log on Twitter, when you hop on and you see um, every time you craft a tweet, you know, you're trying to figure out how can I get the best engagement? Where is this tweet going to go? Um, and, and you are free from that in a sense, but I think the fact that I still have my phone, the fact that uh, the news that I was consuming was so heavily shaped by social media and Twitter, you know, the fact that for my job now, it's almost impossible to do my job as a, as a journalist without interfacing in some way with Twitter, it makes some of the, I think, more, the, the bigger gains from leaving social media or leaving this type of technology behind altogether, it, it, you can't really do it. Um, it, it's, it we, Tools are interesting in that way, right? Because, you know, I mean, we, we, going back to when we first put a stick in the ground to get termites or whatever, like, they, they increase our, they amplify our power. And I think phones, Twitter especially, has amplified our power. But with each of those tools, there's also, it amplifies our power to do terrible things, too. And I don't think we're actually scratching the surface yet of what social media, of what Twitter, uh, of how they change our brains, our, our conversations, our lives, uh, both for the better and for the worse. It's just a vast, uncontrolled experiment with all of our minds. You know, yes. that's a big deal. Um, Laura, uh, you come at this more from the empirical research angle. Mm -hmm. um, what can the research tell us about some of these changes? Uh, and I know some of your focus is on uh, families. 
So what can you tell us about the interaction uh, between family members? Definitely. So um, in looking at smartphone use in particular, um, there have been some studies that have shown um, they can be distracting, especially um, on a work desk. You know, the number of times that we're checking them a day can decrease productivity, but they can also be incredibly powerful tools for connecting with others, and um, children and parents can use them in a number of different ways to enrich our lives, whether it's you know Skyping with a grandparent far away or a family member in the military. Our smartphones are enabling us to be present with people who are geographically separated from us. So I think, um, it, as you mentioned, it's definitely a tool that can be used in a number of different ways, and how we choose to use it really um, can impact our lives. Yeah. I mean, I think a larger frame for this that I've been thinking about a lot over the last few months is that, you know, there was a time when we were dealing with the impacts of the industrial economy, right, which were pollution. And if you think about the way that people talk about what's happening online, the words that they use are kind of cluing us in that there's sort of an environmental problem. That people say, right, there's uh, data can be toxic, toxic outrage culture, all these different ways that even very politically disparate groups use to talk about the online environment, to me suggests that, that we already know that this is kind of an environmental problem, that there's something systemic. And so one of the things I, that I want to talk with all of you about is I feel like there's multiple levels to this, right? We're going to talk about the personal first. So we're going to talk about you know, the things that we each do with our phones, these experiments and behavior modification. Um, and then I want to talk about kind of going up to the more systemic things that can reshape this environment like the research around obesogenic environments, right? If you just follow the path of least resistance in America, you're going to gain weight. And that's just how it works in a lot of places. And I wonder if the same thing has kind of happened around um, our, our, our technological environment. So what I want to ask you all about, and we're going like, to go right to the audience here. We want this to be interactive. Is who here has engaged in an experiment in like modifying your own behavior. So I'll just give you a few examples and then I want to hear from you. Maybe you move Twitter or Facebook off the first screen of your phone. Maybe, I see a nod here. What, what apps, how, how did this work for you? Well, we'll come right to you. I quickly found a shortcut to get to it faster. You quickly <laughs> found a shortcut to get to the app faster. And we're gonna have a mic come around, but I'll, I'll just repeat what, what she said. You know, you move Twitter off the first screen, next thing you know, you're like, well, let's go to the second screen really fast. Boom, right? Um, what's another kind of experiment? And I'll have this microphone come to you. Who's deleted an app? Let's come right here. Happen to know one of Jeff Goldberg's former college classmates. Um, go ahead. Don't date me that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've done a few things recently, um, not the least of which is keeping my phone in a different room. Because I find, even if it's on silent, if I hear the buzz, I, I, I'm still... Like, exactly. <laughs> so I now leave it in a different room. And what I found is, interestingly, whatever I've missed really wasn't that important. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been a different uh, change. Mm -hmm. And the other mm -hmm. thing in terms of apps, I've, constant, I've now gone on a monthly purge of apps that I don't use. But if they're there, I will waste time playing huh. with them on my phone just huh. because they happen to be there. Mm -hmm. So. Anybody, any of you had any experience deleting things from your phone? Yeah, so I deleted Twitter, um, the app, and then I started logging into Twitter on, um, on, the, on, on Chrome. And then I realized that that was becoming too easy because it was remembering my token. So I would just pull up Twitter and I would already be into the feed. Mm -hmm. So then what I did was I started to only log into Twitter on private mode. So I would have to enter my username and password. But I got really, really good at typing my username and password. So like, m like my aspirational self was constantly trying to delete Twitter from my life. And my behavioral self kept saying, uh-uh-uh, I'm going to find a way to create a shortcut to get you on Twitter faster. Um, and I mean, it just goes to show like the, these apps are both so good and so bad at the same time. They are so brilliantly designed to keep us engaged. And frankly, I think there are lots of parts of the economy, um, uh, you know, maybe like healthcare, for example, that could stand to learn a lot about the ability of tech and software to create behavioral patterns. But at the same time, they're also so bad because when you download any sort of application that allows you to see how much time you're wasting on your phone, it's just like, you know, looking at the most disgusting version of yourself in the mirror. <laughs> um, somebody else. Let's go to somebody else's. Uh, a successful modification, maybe. Oh, or not. Oh, it's just sketch. 
scheduling it all because um, there was a time I would wake up in the morning, go to my phone or go to my iPad. I had to reverse that pattern. I start out, it, it gets with a ritual of just quiet time and then after a while, check the iPad, check the huh. phone. And have you been able to maintain that? Yes, over, over a year now. Wow. And it, it does make a difference. Wow. Somebody else. We got right here. Okay. So one thing that I did that I thought was really helpful was turning off the notification icon on Facebook. And echoing the woman in front of me here, one of the things that I realized was a lot of the things that I was quote unquote missing were trivial. And then on top of that, looking at sort of like the discourse that we're in social media right now, I was missing all of this anger. So I've now instituted a rule that not only do I not have that notification, but I'm missing the anger, and if I'm going to post something, I'm only going to post it positive. Huh. Because there's a lot of noise, and I think what we need is a little bit more thought and a little bit more listening. Yeah. So it's helped with stress. You know, I've heard this from a lot of people doing these group therapy sessions about the relationship with their phones. And you know, one of the counter arguments that I hear is that there's a usefulness to the anger. Like you look at what's happening with the hearings, like what's happening with the Me Too movement, you look at various civil rights movements through time and that there's a usefulness to the anger. Um, how, do you, how do you balance that in your own life, being able to have this kind of righteousness come in, but also not have it overwhelm you so that you can actually do good things with it? Well, I don't think we have a word yet for when you spend three hours on Twitter arguing with trolls or doing something, you know, where you know your brain is like, hey, dude, stop and you stop about an hour after your brain tells you to do that. And they don't have a word for like that feeling, the grossness sort of that's like in your brain, but it's also kind of physical, right? There's like a grossness you feel after getting into these arguments, into these sort of, where you're infuriated for three hours and you know, some idiot said something. Someone that is wrong on the clearly internet. Clearly false, you know, you're, you're mad online, right? <laughs> we, we need mad online just It's like troll binging. Yeah, troll binging. <laughs> yeah, right. They feel terrible. And there's, I, I think, uh, when, you, when you look at like, people who talk about righteous anger, who acted out of righteous anger, even, even for them, you know, like, you can't be in that mode 100, 24-7, 100% of your time. You have to be able to balance uh, taking in what motivates you, and some of the motivation is anger, and actually balancing that with, I think, healthy behaviors, with interfacing with people uh, who are in person, um, with spending time with your family. I'm a dad now, so that's my, my, my thing now is um, I can't be three hours into a troll fight and then go and like have constructive time with my son. <laughs> um, it doesn't work. And I think it's, uh, yes, we like to sort of justify our uh, indulging in immediate impulses, but there's no way that doing that over and over again for hours and hours a day, now we have screen time, uh, on our iPhones that can tell us how long we've been online. There's, there's no way that's good for you uh, yeah. every day. Yeah, my most shameful moment as a parent is definitely when my two-year-old daughter says to me, Daddy, put your phone in your pocket. <laughs> like, not just put your phone away, but she's just like, no, you can't have it on the table. You can't have it in your hand. I don't care. She's just like, put your phone in your pocket. And she's two. She can barely even say those words, and she already knows that that's the thing that needs to happen. But she's read the research that says that simply that's having a <laughs> smartphone on a table in front of you distracts your attention from she's the task. She's very intelligent. She's, very, she's on her way. Um, Laura, I want to go to you on the research. Uh, this is something that you look into. Um, what do we know about, you know, because she can also manipulate the phone already, and mm -hmm. this is sort of horrifying reflection of my own behavior to watch her, like, scroll and then fight with me to take, you know, when I try and take the phone away. Um, what do we know about what's happening uh, to her when she's playing with my phone? Definitely. So um, I've actually done some research at Georgetown University with some scholars in the psychology department looking at young children and how they actually have difficulty learning from 2D screen media like um, television, touchscreens, and there's this term called the transfer deficit effect which basically um, is a term that describes the difficulty young children have for transferring what they learn from one dimension to another. So they might be playing an app on their touchscreen and learn a certain thing, but then they need help connecting that to the real world. So maybe they're learning about animals, but then they need help and scaffolding and support from parents 
to um, make those connections when they see it at a zoo or outside in the park or something. Mm -hmm. And do you worry about screen time per se or just some subset of the things that a child might do on a phone? Yeah, I worry less about screen time per se, although it's um, proliferated the media a lot, and more about the content and the context of the use. So with young kids, it's less about how much time they're consuming media, but more about what it is that they're engaging in and who they might be doing it with. So thinking more about the purpose or the potential learning goal or social emotional benefit of yeah. that. And one, uh, it's actually in our next issue of the magazine, uh, I have a story that is about like kids' YouTube, toddler YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which has become enormously popular, and it's a profile of one terrifying. of the... Uh, one of, <laughs> absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it's, it, can be, it can be scary to watch a kid engage with YouTube, particularly one that's, that's very young. But I'll tell you like the hopeful part about it. Um, I started to look into like the history of children's television, and you know, television basically starts to break on the American public in the late 40s. Uh, by the early 50s, there's already hearings on Capitol Hill about children's television um, and what, what television is doing to kids' brains. And over, it took about 20 years, but from like 50 to the late 60s, uh, an educational television developed that pretty much incontrovertibly is pretty good for kids. The educational TV that came out of Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, and then all the commercial shows that those publicly supported things uh, uh, developed, all those techniques, created a pretty good medium. And in fact, um, one of the researchers who did uh, one of the larger studies um, on the impact of television on kids, his final line is kind of this reversal, reversal of Marshall McLuhan's uh, famous line that the medium is the message. He was like, no, it's actually the message is the message. If kids watch good things that teach them like good lessons, they actually come out better. I mean, improved scores on different things. And so that's made me think like if that took, you know, close to 20 years to get to that level of improvement from sort of the baseline, here's what the market's going to do around this technology to now we have something that works for kids. Like, we're probably, you know, five years into this, uh, of these kinds of improvements, and maybe that becomes something um, that, that, that we'll be looking back and going like, hey, you know what? Educational YouTube actually turned into a good thing in 2020. Mm -hmm. And too bad about the kids who came before that, you know? Can I ask you? I'm yeah, yeah. A, 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 totally. not a father, but, yeah. um, I mean, so, it seems to be like the finding, and I haven't read your article yet. I just saw that it went up on, uh, yes. on the site today. Um, it seems like once television programmers figured out good programming for kids, it turned out that good programming on television was good for kids. Is go is, does there exist such a thing as good YouTube programming for kids? And is that the most popular kind of programming that kids consume on YouTube? Or are they essentially the equivalent of an adult give an option to a sort of, you know, full open buffet and they go straight for the desserts and leave the string beans alone? <laughs> well, it is like many parts of the internet. It's like, you know, kids YouTube is bricolage, it's a trash fire, it's like all these different things that you could use. It's just a mishmash of all of these things. A couple surprising things about it. Um, some of the big educational new YouTube brands have actually done quite well. Like there's one called Little Baby Bum. Uh, produced out of, out of London that's, you know, taken the time to kind of understand the lessons of educational TV. I profiled the, a company that's more like kind of in a transitional space. Um, they're located in South India. There's like five friends who just like had this IT services firm, made one video, it did well on YouTube, and they were like, we're going all in. Um, and so they, you know, they're more about capturing kids' attention than they are educating them at this point, but I think they see that that's the clear trajectory, and I think the, the deep systemic question is can, can educational content, which by its very nature needs to be slower paced, more like the reading of a book, that needs to have less attention grabbing uh, animation going on outside the main scene, uh, whether that can compete in an open kind of YouTube environment. And one solution is that like YouTube can just put their finger on the scale for kids. And there is a pretty good YouTube Kids app, and they can just say, hey, educational content, as judged by experts like yourself in educational programming, can just 
get more views, right? I mean, these are things, uh, Derek, to, to throw it back at you on your book, and then we'll make sure everyone else is also talking. But to throw it back on you, I mean, one of the findings of your book was that popular things oftentimes get popular because they're distributed top down. Uh, and so that's kind of my hope for YouTube right now, is that they decide that that's something that they should do. Yeah. Um, in a, what do you think, though? I mean, this is your area of research. Yeah, I feel like YouTube Kids is a really difficult um, whole. There's so much content, and the challenge is the vetting of the material. Anyone can upload something, and anyone can tag it as something that kids want to search for. So say they're really interested in Sesame Street, they can type it in, but... Um, not all the content that's uploaded is appropriate. I think that happened with Peppa Pig. Mm -hmm. There were some clips that were not safe for kids to be viewing. And right. so it's about the constant monitoring, like Facebook is going through and Twitter is going through, the constant monitoring and vetting of content to make sure that it's safe for the users. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Van, I mean, you, you, you described it as terrifying watching your son <laughs> on, on YouTube. Um, what, what do you do to try and not use YouTube as a babysitter? Uh, for the kid? Well, I mean, sometimes you have to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, if there's a screen and I uh, am late on a deadline, then sometimes you got to watch YouTube. Uh, I think the interesting thing with that, though, is there are clearly sort of quality programs, right? There are some things on YouTube where I click on them and it's like, this is great. And I would love to have, you know, like, it's not even just a time waster. It looks like it's something that's genuinely good and beneficial to the kid. And then you step away for a couple minutes and you're three stories on the playlist and it's getting a little weirder. It's getting a little weirder. You know, it's not gross or like, you know, something too out of the, the ordinary, but you know, the songs are a little off. Um, and then two more down the playlist and you're like in the twilight zone. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's, it's not necessarily about the parent choosing the first program. It's YouTube's entire nature, the entire nature of a lot of our uh, internet video watching is that it's a playlist. It's designed to keep you involved in the screen, in the watching, as long as possible. And that's something where it's not episodic or discrete the way television is, the way uh, you know when the end of one program is happening, you know it's gonna be for a certain amount of time, yeah. you can cut it off after that 30 minutes or that hour or whatever. Yeah. On YouTube, you know, it looks, I don't know necessarily when he's in a different program, it looks the same as the last one. Right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> I had to check the progress bar, something like that. And uh, it's, the incentives on the internet are, are so, I know we're, we talked about the, pros, the prospects of a top-down model allowing or promoting, I think, more beneficial, healthier program and behavior, but so much of, and Jeff just talked to Ev kind of about this a little earlier, um, so much of the incentive that's promoted by big developers on the internet is this faux individualism, right? Like it's, it's, uh, or it's this faux community centric, like, oh, we're going to upvote our way to uh, having healthy structures, which doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. And, and all this, the YouTube sort of upvoting system creates all the incentives for some random video of Peppa Pig getting killed by a bus to make it to your kid's YouTube. And so what is Peppa Pig? Uh, <laughs> Peppa Pig is a The single guy had asked the question. Is a pig. <laughs> British? A British pig. Uh, I don't know if anyone have a better description of Peppa Pig. It's a, okay, it's a, it's a, it's a pig. Do, right? It's a yeah, pig, it's cartoon it's pig. Cartoon. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's yeah. a cartoon yeah. pig. It's very important. Very important. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but, and so, due to some licensing things, you can't really get official Peppa Pig videos online. You can kind of get like the Peppa with the one Bootleg. Feet. Bootleg. Bootleg, Peppa yeah, bootleg right. Peppa Pig. <laughs> yeah. And some of them look kind of legit. You know, it's like a, a regular setup. The voice a little different, but you know, no two-year-old's going to notice that. Yeah. But then three videos down and Peppa's getting shot out of a cannon. And so, <laughs> yeah. So, um, jumping off a little bit of uh, what Jeff asked Ev earlier and, and the way that you're describing these systems not working, I want to open it back up to the audience and ask what it, I think it's hard for us to, for something that's as big as this, it's hard for us to admit something may have gone wrong. And the question is, was social media, writ large, just a mistake? Was like the very idea of creating these social networks and using them uh, to distribute news, information, and structure our relationships with our families and friends, that's how I'm defining social media here, was that a mistake? What do we think? Do I see a hand? 
I'm bouncing it to you. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, I've been getting, giving thought to this about the or origins, the DNA and social media, which was originally started to basically humiliate people or rape people. And now it seems that we're at a point since it's accessible to more users, I mean, from Harvard's campus, et cetera, we're trying to turn it into something more positive. I mean, uh. how, how do we wrench that DNA out of uh. Uh, that peer pressure? Huh. That's interesting. That's a reversal, I think, of the normal, uh, the kind of normal narrative, which has been tech was good for a while, and now tech is bad. That sort of is, but it's interesting to hear uh, the other perspective. Maybe it was in the DNA from the beginning that starting a service in a Harvard dorm and now having two, two billion people use it was, uh, was maybe a strange pathway. Somebody else want to speak to it? Let's go, let's go right there. Yeah. So in my personal opinion, I do think that social media has been a detriment, at least for me personally. Um, I grew up in a period when I do remember what, what it was like to actually be in the moment, um, to be with my friends and not pull out my cell phone to text or check. I definitely had a flip phone, which only made calls. <laughs> um, and so when I think about my productivity throughout the day, I feel like it's been diminished because of Instagram and a Twitter and that FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, so I think that social media for certain people or even technology for social media was a way for them to connect to people that they essentially couldn't reach or maybe in their personal individual lives they were, thri they were seeking more. But for me, someone who actually enjoys living and being in the moment, I feel like it hasn't fully benefited, benefited me in my life as much as people like to promote that mindset. We're going to go to the question right behind you in a second. I, I just wanted to note that w there was an amazing uh, interview that we had at one of our previous events with a guy who made a movie called Eighth Grade, uh, which is about an eighth grader. Um, and the director of the movie was like, look at the world in which teenagers sort of find themselves, you know, oftentimes not a lot to, to do. And of course, they're like, I want to be in my phone, like relative to uh, the world that they see around them and the injustice they see and all these other things, like the phone, which connects them to people they know and ideas that they're interested in, as well as like all the bad things of the world, like seems like the better place to be, you know, for, for a lot of these kids. Okay, let's go there. Hi, April McLean Delaney. I'm actually Washington Director at Common Sense Media, and we're the leading nonprofit in the country that deals with how media impacts kids' health and well-being. But it's, you've touched on a multitude of issues with humanity and tech, and the first, just jumping back, the screen time issue is a really important issue in terms of the quantity and context, but also it's really important for parents to be very intentional with respect to kids about a digital, their own digital wellness and the breaks in it. And it comes, it's, we do a lot on that in terms of educating both parents and kids about how they, how they utilize that in the best possible means. But with respect to social media, we've done a lot of research on this with how, you know, the FOMO, missing out, all of those types of things. And we just did a research study asking the kids themselves whether they thought social media was beneficial or not. And many of them thought that, their, that social media was better in a multitude of ways in terms of interconnection and allowing them to interface with one another. But that the most vulnerable kids, those kids who suffer from self-esteem or what have you, were most adversely impacted. And that there is, you know, it's the way in which they're utilized and in how, um, how many positive interactions they have outside of social media, which really in, impacts their health and well-being. So there's so many issues. but. I think there is a responsibility on tech's part, and you start to see a lot of um, the big uh, tech companies are starting to really um, have tools to help individuals, include kids and adults, monitor their own screen huh. time. So I was going to ask you, your, my question was, do you see any obligations by the tech companies to really look at how humanity is impacted? Um, we did a Truth About Tech conference, and a lot of the tech programmers said they felt like they were philosophers and almost ethicists as much as software programmers because of the how they um, were impacting the social, emotional, and cognitive well-being of, of people. So, so, go ahead. I have a take. Um, well, it may seem, I think, from my comments so far that I'm a, a pessimist about social media, um, but I'm 29. 
I've been using Twitter for 10 years, so I've been using Twitter for more than a third of my life. I've been using social media for more than half of my life. Um, and I do think there are sort of baseline positivities where if we do have a responsible tech industry, people who are actually considering the externalities, just like driving. Driving is clearly beneficial. <laughs> Having roads is beneficial. Being able to get from place to place is beneficial. People dying in accidents is bad. And we need to build an infrastructure that's mindful of all those things. For me, as a, as a, as a black man who was on sort of, was in Twitter heavy before I became a journalist, who was connected to all these events happening around the world, all these, uh, I think the only way we know about police brutality in the way that we know it was because of Twitter. Uh, and Twitter was a vehicle for really waking lots of people up to the realities of, of, of what happened in Ferguson, of what happened with all these police shootings. It actually moved the needle, it moved investigators, it moved the Justice Department in the, in the shooting of Laquan McDonald in, in Chicago. It's done, I think, this really admirable job in some ways, maybe not even in a purposeful way, at connecting people to stories they would not have heard otherwise, not just domestically, but when you talk about the Arab Spring, things like that. And those are sort of always the, the feathers in the cap that the people in Silicon Valley always bring up when they, when we, okay, Twitter is bad now, but you got connected to the Arab Spring because of Twitter. Or, or you know, and I think uh, essentially we're using the fact that you can go from one place to the other on the road as a cover for not making the road safer, right? And, and, and that's where we are now. The infrastructure, the tools are often built and developed before we have a sense of just the bad they can do. And it's really incumbent upon not just the people in the industry, but us as consumers to uh, think about digital wellness in, in, uh, in, in, in terms we have never really considered before. Um, and, and that's really where we are now. We're, we're sort of leaving the Wild West and coming to a place where we realize there do have to be rules. We can't have unmoderated online conversations and expect nothing to ever happen. Um, and that's where we are. Yeah. I think that's a really, really great point. I'm really glad that we entered this phase of the conversation because I'm totally on board with all the things the tech has done that are bad. But it's really important to point out the bright side of a bottom-up revolution. So just to be clear, there are a lot of downsides of a loss of top-down control. One of them is that your kid starts looking at a cartoon pig, and then 15 minutes later, he or she has clicked on a video of the pig being shot out of a cannon. Like, that's the bad side. <laughs> because when you tune into Sesame Street, you don't see, like, Cookie Monster getting super drunk by the end of the episode. <laughs> like, when you have top-down control, you, you have top-down control over the programming. At the same time, I don't think that the Me Too revolution, the Black Lives Matter revolution, would have happened without social media. Yeah. or at least I feel even more certain that it wouldn't, they wouldn't be as culturally shifting as they've been, particularly for young people in America. I think that we are on the cusp of Gen Z coming in and having the same wrenching changes that everyone said millennials have. This is a really, really fascinating generation. And we sort of began to investigate it in an Atlantic article about the detrimental effect of smartphones on the teenage mind. I think that article as well was called Are Smartphones Ruining a Generation? Uh, it was a psychologist named Gene Twenge who presented a series of really, really compelling graphs showing that once smartphone penetration passed 50%, all of a sudden, you saw teen anxiety shoot up, uh, the number of hangouts with friends go down, um, and, uh, and kids were having less sex as well. They were dating less. At the same time, if you look at government teen surveys, which they do every five years at the federal level, you have less truancy, you have less teen drinking, uh, fewer teen pregnancies, less teen crime, and you also, I think, have a scenario where young people, teenagers, are more explicitly aware of the worlds outside of their networks. If they are, if they go to a, go to school in, you know, a mostly white suburb, like private school, they can still see on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram what's happening to black men and the, the, the tragedy of criminal justice in a way that I think was impossible 30 years ago when top-down programming was was run by white guys on the coast who didn't think that young unarmed black men being shot by cops would fit in the A block of that evening's news. So there's a lot going on, and it's too simple, I think, to say that it's all bad, it's all good, and it's important, I think Van is right, to point out that there are clear bright sides to a bottom-up revolution in media. Yeah, I've thought a lot about this, you know, back in the, when people were first starting to study information networks, you know, there was this supposed science of, of networks information called cybernetics. 
And they came up with all these rules for how networks were supposed to work. This is like in the 50s and the 60s. And one of them was that networks that had a lot of what they called positive feedback, so like you do one thing, it gets even more of that thing, like a herd uh, starting to run, that it would have like certain effects in the information ecosystem. And one of them would, was that it would amplify what were called weak signals. Um, and weak signals here doesn't mean like weak as in bad, it just means like among all the noise of the world, like it's, it's a small thing, right? So the Kavanaugh is not like a weak signal. We, that is a very strong signal, but individual instances of injustice or racism or sexism out in the world are actually kind of weak signals. And what, one thing I've, I've thought so much about uh, watching you know, Twitter and Facebook unfold over the last 10 years of my life is like how often weak signals now end up going big, you know, whether it's someone writing something weird on a receipt to a waitress, whether it's uh, like uh, out in Oakland, um, there's a, a woman out referred to as Barbecue Becky because she, she tried to call those. She in fact did call the cops on some guys who were just barbecuing in a pretty obviously racist incident. And, uh, and those kinds of things, you're right, that didn't, generally speaking, make it into the paper. I do a lot of work in archives with newspapers, and one thing you find is Mexican history, black history, women's history, like, just kind of, it's not there. There's these massive, you know, archival gaps. And I think that we are in a different phase because these things can acquire uh, a widespread um, notoriety. At the same time, you think about when people talk about very extreme fringe views on the right. Those things are also weak signals. And so the very same kind of informational systems that would pick up these other instances can now take things that were incredibly fringe views, you know, even like 10 years ago within the Republican Party, and now it can bring them much closer into kind of the, the, the mainstream. And, and that is something that will work the same way on the left as well. Yeah, it's interesting because like, there's a famous sociological paper called The Power of Weak Ties, about how weak ties in a network end up having an outsized effect on the network itself. You're talking about the power of weak signals, and I think it's a very real thing that it doesn't make sense for the Washington Post to run as its A1 story, look at this amazingly weird note that was written on the back of a restaurant receipt. That doesn't make any sense. But for that note to be the most tweeted story of the day, on Twitter, or the most shared story of the day on Facebook, isn't weird because these are intimate networks that prize intimacy. And when you see moments of weird intimacy, those moments actually tend to thrive on social media in a way that they don't thrive on top-down media. I'm not sure that, that, has, that there's like an obvious connection from that to the more important aspects of Black Lives Matter or Me Too, but there are really, obviously, really big differences between the sort of media that has historically been prized in traditional media and the, historic, the kind of media that can thrive on social media. Yeah. Um, I want to throw it open generally to questions. We you know, have maybe eight minutes left. Um, and you know, we've been following our own passions up here. Uh, and I want to, I want to hear from, from some of you, both questions and, you know, I'll even take more of a comment than a question. Wow. Kind of questions. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's right. That's First right. time in Atlantic that's, history. Don't use this uh, generosity. <laughs> um, let's go all the way to the back. We haven't taken one from there yet. Uh, hi. My name's Alexander. Uh, my daughter's in kindergarten. And my wife and I talk a lot about what, uh, when she'll get different freedoms. And so we talk about her getting to ride the subway on her own around maybe fifth or sixth grade and getting a cell phone by uh, ninth grade. And as we think about that, I'm assuming the New York City subway will still be here then. But I tell my wife that by the time our daughter's in ninth grade, the cell phones are gonna be implanted in our heads. <laughs> so my wife thinks I'm crazy. Wh who's right? <laughs> The wife's always right. Yeah, I was about to say, she's definitely right. Uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I'll tell you this, as someone, you know, probably of this group who uh, covers kind of the ins and outs of technological development the most, I think that um, I have expected this paradigm, which is, you know, to say this magical screen that can do everything, to go away for about five or six years already. Um, there were all kinds of different attempts. Anyone remember Google Glass, right? That was going to put a little thing in front of your eye. I, I am a real pessimist around all voice control, for what that's worth. It's an incredibly slow way of getting information in and out of a device. Uh, so despite many attempts and despite my fervent wishes that this paradigm would go away, I think it's going to stay around. Um, and, and one reason is 
there's a, there's a great uh, study by this woman named Natasha Dowshul, who's a, uh, an anthropologist at MIT. She goes to Vegas and she writes this amazing book about how Vegas gamblers uh, got addicted by Vegas technology, because now all the slot machines are all algorithmic and all this other stuff. And one thing she describes is that the gamblers, you think they're playing to win money, but they're not. And in fact, they get annoyed when they win. And so she's interviewing these people like, but you won, that's the point of the game. And they're like, no, it gets me out of what they call the machine zone, when they're in the machine zone. And I think a lot of what people are looking for when they're on their phone is not actually a particular piece of information. It's not to connect with someone. It's literally to pull their thumb down and have some new things show up and be like, ooh, pull their thumb down again, ooh. Like that machine zone, it's crazy as it seems. When I find myself in it, I'm just like, Psh. What is wrong with you? But I know that all the people around me are doing the same thing, and I don't think anything does that as effectively as these devices. But one thing I think we will see more of in the future is um, social robotics. I don't know if you guys have encountered robots anywhere out and about yet, but they're being used for a lot of interesting purposes from everything from medicine to even ordering at a restaurant. I saw one in San Francisco in the airport. Um, I think that also augmented reality or, um, is going gonna, is gonna, to um, emerge soon in, in more commercial and everyday uses, but we're still not at that at that level yet of the Google Glass, you know, right. making right. it accessible to everyone. Yeah. That's a great point. Let's go right, I'm gonna, yeah, right there, perfect, yes. That's actually a perfect lead into my question. So okay. you were talking earlier about it taking television 40 something years to figure out how to do good television. So this technology is moving forward faster than Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. Do we have 40 years? Because from where I'm sitting, it doesn't look like it. Yeah. It's a good, uh, it's a good question. Um, do we have 40 years to do what? To fix YouTube. To fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, I, I'll, I'll rephrase the question uh, only slightly, which is because television was basically static. Up, you know, we had broadcast and we had cable. It was basically two big regimes. Uh, these technologies are maybe changing much faster than than that. Uh, that's one one possible premise sure. to invest. I guess. But, I guess um, I would say I, I apologize in advance for answering the question by not answering it or saying it's unanswerable. We didn't fix TV. You know, like I'm not going to name names here, but you know, there are networks that are extremely popular right now in the United States that are more dangerous than any television channel that I think existed in the 1960s. So we haven't fixed television. And the, pro the reason that these platforms are unfixable is because both top-down and bottom-up media have are a double-edged sword. That the problem with bottom-up media is that it gets you the cartoon pig shot out of the cannon. And the problem with top-down media is that top-down media is controlled by a finite number of people who have non-perfect motivations. And so we're going to fix YouTube. We're going to fix YouTube's, or at least address very seriously YouTube's 2018 problem. But YouTube, or you know, Brain YouTube, Brain Tube, is going to have 2073 problems. It's get, like th there's not going to be a moment where like you know, 2024, the year we fix YouTube. Um, it, it, this stuff is just so hard because media is made by people and people are so complex and often so, so bad. I think like the, an incremental way of thinking about this is it's the model that you're getting from your phone versus from a set of newspapers and magazines or television. Is that model of the world like uh, more or less accurate, right? Like when you read your phone, when you read your news, are you actually coming to understand the world in, in ways that let you move in it well? Um, and I think that uh, I, I think there's an enormous amount of improvement that can happen uh, within the, the social media world that you know has already ha there have been decades for some of these other uh, places to develop hierarchies of importance and improve them through time. And uh, I think social media will have something like that happen. Well, we, we go over here. Yeah. Uh, oh, here we got a mic coming. I would just say it's going to be in iterations, right? Like the civil rights movement doesn't didn't change overnight, and it took people's anger with you know my kid watching getting a pig killed on YouTube, and 
enough anger for it to be like, how do we put some policies and restrictions in place? I don't think tech companies are going to be incentivized until people stand up and say, hey, who do we want to be and what are what is our intention? With these things? Yeah. Well, I think the civil rights movement is a really good double metaphor, though, for yeah. both how effectively we can be moved at making solutions and also at how good humans are right. at adapting to bad things. Right. Right. And so, I mean, civil rights movement doesn't happen without TV also. It's, it's a master class in utilizing the medium of TV, you've written about right. this, um, for uh, getting people to, to care and move on things. But also at the very same time, during the civil rights movement, we have the, the, the advent of the sort of televised debates that become the forerunner to 24-7 news, that become the forerunner to partisan 24-7 news. So all the same sort of mechanisms that are in place, uh, we have made very good things out of them and very bad things. And I think the upshot for me, thinking about 2073, thinking about the future of whenever we have brain tube or whatever, is there are going to be terrible things, but humans are just eminently adaptable at taking bad things and, and making our, building our lives around them. We build our, our entire work day, our, our dinners now around the reality of television in some really harmful ways. Um, and we've just accepted those as normal. We've accepted now that our politics now is sort of run by partisan 24-7 news and it's unavoidable. Um, and maybe we're going to accept that brain tube controls our children <laughs> and forces them to do, you know, strange things if we like the good things enough. Yeah. I like, I mean, human adaptability uh, is a good place to end, I think, in a, a session on humanity and technology. Um, and I think you've heard a good range, even from within the same people, of pessimism and optimism that I think almost everybody feels when they pick up their phone and have that kind of squirt of love and hate uh, emotions in their minds. Um, so thank you very much and have a great rest of the festival. Thank you.